episode 14 fireside chat with jason hickey logo bro part two Welcome to the 14th episode of The Car Diary with Javi S. Thompson. I am your host, Denny Cards, and thank you for joining me from wherever you're listening to this from. You can find me on Instagram at Denny underscore cards or Javi S. Thompson, all one word on Instagram. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, I would really appreciate if you left a review so that this podcast could reach more people because I would love it if more people got to hear the story about Jason Hickey and pulling the LeBron triple logo man and his involvement with the show King of Collectibles. There is literally no one else in the hobby space who has the guests I have been able to find, and we're just getting started, so I'm really excited. So if you could help me uplift this uh, podcast, I would really appreciate that. So in part two, Jason and I talk about his involvement in the Netflix show King of Collectibles with the Golden Touch, And I say it in the chat that we have, but I'll say it here again. My family and I really enjoyed the show. And no, no one from the show is asking me to do this or forcing me to do it. It's just that I truly, well, we truly enjoyed it as a family. And that's what I wanted to talk about in this intro to this episode. Um, So, for instance, my wife, she liked the music items. My younger son is more into Pokemon, so he liked the Pokemon parts. But this was truly a great bonding experience with my older son, who was getting more into basketball and basketball cards. I think I may have mentioned this in the past, but he is now the age when I first started collecting cards, my older son, that is. And that's why it's especially awesome, in my opinion, that Fanatics is getting the MBA and MBPA licenses so that my kids can chase refractors, not just silvers and hollows with Panini. I know it's the same kind of card. But it's just my opinion that the difference is massive. So anyway, back to the show that Jason was on. I really like the editing, the producing. You know, people have talked about, you know, whether it was acting or not. But I think for some, you know, some of these reality shows, you do have to have some set scenes. So I thought all of that was good. The humor, the drama, it was all really well done. But the one aspect I really wanted to hone in on uh, for this intro is the diversity that was presented on the show. So if you watched the show, I don't know how much this resonated with you, but for me, it meant so much because I'm of the belief that representation matters. And so to see someone like Alex Fung on the screen, for instance, my son could point to him and say, yes, I want his job. And it's so cool to do that kind of work. And for others with other complexions to see Maisha and the father-son scouting team and Ryan, although maybe, you know, that was a spray tan and Alex, uh, same thing, but, you know, certainly representing for New Jersey and shout out to my New Jersey listeners. You know, my wife is from there as well. So, and then you have the international cast of buyers all over the world. So, For me, it was just so great to see not just a well-edited show, but one that had so much diversity. And it was, to me, not just forced diversity. As far as I know, it was natural and organic. And that's what I loved so much about the show. So on that note, I know diversity can be a difficult topic to talk about for some folks. But I do want to take some time here to talk about diversity in the hobby. Because earlier this month, and right now I'm recording this in late June of 2023, So in early June of 2023, diversity and inclusion was a hot topic in Instagram, uh, in hobby Instagram. And I don't want to rehash what has happened so far and say who did what, and I don't want to misconstrue it and, and not accurately portray everything. So some people will immediately understand what I'm talking about, and others may be scratching their heads and have no clue, and both are totally fine, okay? My plan is still to give you the listener evergreen content but that's in the realm of cards and card prices but when it comes to the hobby landscape we are not just myself but we are living in the moment and fixed in time where in the past you know i've mentioned how we're at a crossroads in the hobby i know i've said that in past episodes and 
that crossroads is with fanatics coming in. And I know there's a lot of talk about 10 X and the hobby and what, whether that's even achievable, but we know that we're in a really important place right now in 2023, because there's a market correction. We're going to see who stays, who goes, and you know, the landscape's going to be different. It just is. So with all of this talk on hobby Instagram, I will admit that I've stayed mostly on the sidelines to see it unfold and just to observe and not react. I very much admit I'm a newer voice in the current hobby landscape. And honestly, I don't see myself moving the needle much one way or the other. And quite frankly, I, I really didn't want to make things worse. So that said, I read and observed and absorbed what both sides had to say. And and I'm actually quite sympathetic to both sides. And I hate even saying, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to say the word hate. I dislike even saying sides because I think in the hobby, we are a circle. And I know that sounds very kumbaya, but that's just the person I can be sometimes. And especially when it comes to this type of subject matter. And again, I don't want to rehash what's happened so far. I don't want to misconstrue it or do a bad job of explaining it. But I do want to say this really important thing. There is no one face of the hobby or a group of people who represent the hobby. Some faces and platforms might have bigger microphones and bigger presences. But we all represent the hobby with our participation in it, with our money spent, with the engagement we do, with all the minutes spent listening to hobby podcasts and watching YouTube videos about the hobby, watching breaks and streams. And I get a demographic breakdown for my audience for things like age, gender, country of origin, but not for race. And when I say country of origin, just, you know, like where they're listening from. But I don't get that for race, which is totally fine, but I do wonder what that racial breakdown might look like. But I also know that one person or one group of people do not own or control this hobby landscape. We all do. We do. The 99%. Okay. As my kids enter into the hobby, they're going to be part of that 99%. And I want this hobby to be left in a better place than what I found as a kid. I've talked about my past experiences in the hobby, and, and I got to say, nostalgia, it really is one heck of a drug because it lets you forget the bad stuff and you only remember the good stuff. But as a kid, have I dealt with racist shop owners? Yes, I have. Have I dealt with racist comments on hobby Instagram when I came back into the hobby in 2022 last year? Yes, I have. And I'm not going to provide details to those right now, but it has happened. And... So what I'll do is I'll do what I can with my small platform here to see what change I can help affect, but it's not going to come overnight. It's not going to be quick, but it's going to happen. It's just, it's inevitable. It's a matter. It's just a matter of time, but it's going to be tough getting there. It's the discussions will be difficult. The interactions may be awkward and clunky, but I do want to do my part to make this hobby more inclusive. But here is an important thing that I do have to say, and this is me just being really vulnerable or real. Okay. And, and that is as an Asian American in the United States. And again, we have to remember this really is an American center point of view here that I'm about to say, because every country deals with, with its own past. Again, shout out to my Canadian and German listeners and still no Korean listeners. I mean, come on. You know, I love you. <laughs> um, but as an Asian American, the race discussion in America is squarely white and black. It just is. And it does feel like people who look like me, at least I, this is just my opinion and how I feel, because I don't want to speak for everyone. But I feel like people who look like me are on the sidelines or not, or just not sure where we fit in. And that's how I felt a lot of my life. And I will very much admit, and I won't say who it was, but I've been told by some folks to sit this hobby fight out. And I, I don't even like to use that word fight. Uh, but I did initially listen. I just wanted, again, like I said earlier, I just observed and I read and I learned. But my heart really does go out to everyone because, you know, the first thing is the focus gets away from the cardboard on one hand. But then on the other hand, 
we really do need to have an inclusive hobby space, especially if we are to grow this hobby to heights that we have never seen. And that just doesn't happen with the same group of buyers, the same group of dealers, the same group of distributors, the same group of anything. Because when you keep saying the same group of something, that is the status quo. And in society, aren't we supposed to be breaking away from the status quo to learn from the past, to do better in the present, to be better for the future? Isn't that how we grow? You know, get out of the status quo. That's how we grow. And man, I did totally did not plan for that to rhyme. But that's awesome. Put that on a t-shirt. So, okay, kidding aside, I'm going to process this more. And maybe I, I discuss it again in the future. But also maybe not. I don't know. I don't know where this podcast is going to take me. But I, I at least wanted to get my words out and my thoughts out in some fashion. I mean, possibly from for my own benefit. But I hope that you as a listener can take something away from this. And I will try to be mindful of diversity and inclusion in the hobby with the actions I take, uh, you know, in and out of this podcast with the guests I have on this podcast. But I also can't force and should not force anyone to be on this, right? I mean, that's just not how things work. I can only put the asks out there to a diverse group of people. And I have. And if they want to come on, that's great. But if they decline or leave me on red happens to all of us right or our schedules don't work out um and and i definitely try to be flexible towards my schedule uh, towards my guests with their schedules because i just as a host i i want people to feel uh comfortable and that you know i'll do my best to accommodate them but all i can do is have on guests who can make it right so uh i do want folks to know that i do have a great slate of guests coming up and some of them will represent more diversity in the hobby. Um, I know up to this point, maybe it hasn't looked like that. But, um, you know, like, let me know. I mean, you, listener, reach out to me. Let me know who you think would be good for this podcast, and I'll see what I can do. But until then, I know I have a great slate of guests, like I said, coming up. Um, and you know what? Honestly, this has gone on way too long. Uh, I didn't plan for this to be the intro for this particular episode, but I did want to just address something that's been on my mind for a long time. So I want to say I very much thank my guest who came in today. We talk about the show. We talk about diversity. So I thought maybe this is the right time to kind of bring up these issues. Um, I don't know. Maybe you disagree, and that's okay. So without further ado part two, that rhymes, of my chat with Logo Bro, Jason Hickey. Hope you enjoy. But no, um, you, oh, let's talk about uh, another recent poll. Um, the the triple logo man of LeBron Luca Curry got, got pulled recently, right? Um, yeah. What was your first thought that came to your mind when you heard that news? Why wasn't it me? But that, uh, <laughs> that that sounds selfish, and to do it back to back years would be pretty ridiculous. But I'm a huge, I, I'm not the biggest LeBron fan, and yeah. uh, that sounds terrible coming from mm -hmm. a guy who profited from uh, you know <laughs> one of his largest cards. But uh, I'm a huge Curry and huge Lo Luca fan, so uh, uh, you know that would have been a pretty sweet card to uh, you know even be a third owner of as well. All right, I did have this in my show notes or my my little question thing. Let's do it right now. Start, bench, cut. Le LeBron on the Cavs, LeBron on the Heat, LeBron on the Lakers. Those three that were on that card. Start, bench, and cut. Oh man, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go start LeBron on. The original Cavs teams. Original, yeah. Original Cavs. And then I'm going to – I'm going to cut the Miami Heat because mm. when he went to South Beach, I couldn't stand how he did it. So uh, and anything on the Heat, I'm not a huge fan of. <laughs> that said, um, I'll put him on the bench on the Lakers because I mm. still respect the hell out of, uh, you know, the player that he is. I mean, the guy yeah. is – there's there's no doubt 
um, how amazing he is, right? And uh, right. unbelievable athlete, unbelievable basketball player. I'm just a Jordan guy, so it's uh, it's one of those things that I uh, I always struggle with, but he's unbelievable. So it's interesting because I you mentioned that you were uh, you know you grew up your whole life in New York, and you know I grew up in there as a child, and um, I thought maybe you would be a Knicks fan, and if you are the I mean. I mean, like, it didn't matter what city you were in, like, I guess maybe except Utah, but like, if you were from the state of Utah, you might have really hated Jordan, but even like the people who he, he would beat, it just, we all loved Jordan. He was, he was just so charismatic and electrifying and athletic and amazing. I mean, he had that Riz, which is what I mentioned in one of my earlier po episodes. Um, so, but I can understand why you don't like the heat. I mean, the Knicks and heat in the nineties, just such rock fights. I mean, we're talking uh, Pat Riley defecting, right? Um, like Stan Van Gundy hanging from Alonzo Mourning's leg. Charlie Ward flipping, you know, body body slammed by P.J. Ward or the vice versa. I don't even know. It was so crazy. That That's when basketball was great, right? Well, even <laughs> I mean, even when at least as an I am a diehard Knicks fan. But like yeah. you said, I mean, Michael Jordan was just transcendent. Yeah. Right. The uh, you turn on the TV, you weren't turning it off when that guy was on the screen. Right. And as much right. as I love the Knicks, he was uh, he was my favorite player. And yeah. still is. No, absolutely. Um, oh, I mean, OK, I, I'm not going to go down the Jordan rabbit hole. I could. And I feel <laughs> like we would have a lot of fun doing it. But being at the about the 45 minute mark, I, I want to be respectful of your time. And 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 I guess. I think the wash is done now, but again, I'm not going to change it to dry. I wanted to, before we go to King of Collectibles, and I think it's a good segue because um, I my, my family loved the show. They really did. So I wanted to um, ask you, and maybe this is the, about the point where I'll cut it into the second part because, you know, I don't want to have like an hour and a half or an hour long um, episode, but going to, all right, here's how I'll say it. In past episodes, I would ask questions to ChatGPT. Hey, help me out with a question. Just, you know, like a fun little thing. I, I soon found out I can't do that for every guest and it would just be, it's, it's not that fun. Okay. So um, I asked my kids, I asked them, uh, hey, I, I, first of all, I told them like, you know, that guy on TV, I'm going to, I'm going to interview him or I'm going to have a chat with him and he's going to be on my podcast. First, they were like, when did you have a podcast? <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you about that. Um, Cause I do it when you guys go to sleep. Right. Um, but I, I said, yeah, I'm, he's, I'm going to be able to talk to him. And they were like, I want to stay up. I want to stay up. And I was like, no, you got to go to bed. You know, you got all that. And so I asked them, can you give me a question that you would like to ask Mr. Hickey? So yeah. here we go. This is a verbatim. And I wrote it down. Um, my older son, who's 10, this is a verbatim how we asked it. And then we'll go to my uh, other son after you, you answer this question. How emotionally connected were you to the card and were you proud that you pulled it? Congratulations on pulling the card. How long did you have, have the card before you sold it? What a great question. All right. So let's, uh, let's start with the first part. Was I emotionally connected? I, I would say for about I don't know, 48 hours, mm -hmm. right? That I felt like, wow, this is life changing. This thing has been talked about forever or not forever, but for a long yeah, time, right? Yeah, the chase yeah. was on, right? So yeah, it, yeah. I felt very emotionally connected to it. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? I mean, definitely hobby forever, right? I mean, time flies oh, yeah. so fast in the hobby. It's like a week can feel like a month and vice and, and so on. Um, so he asked, how emotionally connected were you to the card? Were you proud that you pulled it? And then he he's such my son. Like, congratulations on pulling the card. He wanted me to say that to you. So polite. Con congratulations on pulling the card. How long did you have it before you sold it? So it's like a three-parter question. Were you proud that you pulled it? I imagine yes, but in your own words. And then how long did you have it before you sold it? Yeah, I you know, like you said, as it relates to the hobby, I was proud to be, you know, part of what I think is hobby history right now, mm -hmm. just based yeah. upon the chase and, uh, and the story behind it. So yeah, I was, uh, I was extremely proud of that. Um, and your son is extremely polite and I love that. So uh, thank you to him for asking that question. And how long did it, so it was probably from, you know, May 6th, the original poll, it's, we didn't have it in our hands, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, 
we got to uh, make a trip down to Florida, get to see the card, held it in our hands for, I don't know, maybe we spent an hour with the card. Um, and then it ultimately went off to uh, Mr. Golden on his private jet. And then um, we saw it again during filming of the show, but that was pretty much about it. So not a lot of time spent with the card itself. Mm, interesting. So the show made it seem like it was in your possession the entire time and you brought it to Mr. Golden. But the way you're maybe saying it, he had it and they kind of edited it. So it looked like you guys were bringing it into his office. Yeah. So at that point, you know, we had had conversations. Okay. Right. Um, and I wouldn't say it was technically, he was not the, you know, outright owner of the card yet. Got it. Got it. Um, but logistically, there were some things, you know, ultimately that we had to do um, to get it in a safe place because we didn't want to have the responsibility between the three, uh, you know, owners of the card. Oh, you keep it at your house. And you, <laughs> I can't you know, you yeah. Or, you yeah. know, King Mitz, well, you keep it in Las Vegas or Jason, you keep it in New York. So right. there were some logistical things. And, <laughs> you know, when lawyers get involved, that's, uh, it's never fun. Right. So almost like vol uh, putting it in a safe hand, uh, a, a very trusted individual who was able to uh, hold it for you until it was time to, you know, that's excellent. That is awesome. Correct. Um, and again, congratulations. Uh, you did answer. So let's go from the polite, uh, the politeness of my older son to maybe the, the, the straight to the matter. I won't say impolite because he's not, he's very polite as well, but my younger son who's eight, his question or questions was, um, who bought the card and what other big cards have you pulled in your life? I mean, maybe he was just wasn't impressed by a, you know, a triple logo, man. He just wants to know what else have you pulled? Like it's like, it's a very kid. It's a younger question, I guess. But um, do you know who bought the card and, you know, like, you know, other notable big pulls that you've had? Yeah, I would. So we don't know who bought the card. Okay. Um, we had, you know, inquired about that and uh, you know, there's NDAs associated there with, yep. you know, through the buyer and golden. So we don't know, you know, during the show, there was a little bit of a hint of like the phone call and, hey, I'm in the club. Can you put in my bid? And, you know, people people who know the industry may know, you know, maybe it's one of a you know, couple people. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm really interested to find out if it ever comes to market again on uh, right. who actually owns it. That'll be pretty cool. As far as, you know, other big polls, I had a pretty... Last year, I had a pretty good run of some large Trevor Lawrence polls that, mm. uh, you know, I've since moved on from and have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, profited pretty decently from, especially when, uh, you know, Trevor, once they were in the playoffs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, are doing some good things. I, I would say more of my larger ones were on the football side of the house last year. And then this year, I've had a pretty good run of uh, some big Steph Curry polls out of flawless, which has been fantastic. A couple good Jason Tatum polls, mm. um, no additional, you know, logo men cards that I can speak of in 2023. Although I've been uh, pretty much buying into uh, a lot of flawless breaks and trying to get the Celtics and a PYT to get the Tatum oh, yeah. logo man autograph, which would be pretty cool. Even though I'm a Knicks fan, I'm, uh, I am a fan of Jason Tatum. He is very good too. No, absolutely. He's, he, he's, uh, I, you know, I, I see his Instagram feed and he's, you know, showing his son. I, I, I think his name is Deuce or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's just such a good, he, you know, he's, he's, he's a good one in the hobby, uh, in, in the, in the NBA, because as we know, I mean, we won't mention those names again, but there are definitely some people who are getting some hot water recently. So it's nice to have, uh, you know, we like to think, you know, in, in our, hobby and the collecting cards like this hero worship we want to we want to believe that these folks are decent um you know but of course we are all human and um they are very young and you know people do make mistakes so yeah he, see, he seems like a great dad but like you said i mean uh you get all that money in your hands at a young age i mean i uh i've made plenty of mistakes in my life i can't imagine uh, being that young having that type of money right it's almost like um I was too poor to get into super big trouble. I mean, it's a joke, but it's almost <laughs> like 
the more money you have, you can just exacerbate your your problems. Like you can just really get into trouble because you can afford to do some really crazy things. But no, I yeah. yes, as someone in his twenties and even thirties, hopefully not too much in my forties, but um, I mean, you, you yeah, you're, when you're young, you you just <laughs> mistakes are just part of growing up, I guess. True. So. Um, Okay, so here's the thing about <laughs> let's let's transition from the um, from the troubles of NBA players to my kids loved the Netflix show A King of Collectibles so much. Um, There's so many things they liked about it, and I may do like an intro talking about um, other aspects of it. And I know that one of the things that I liked was like the diversity in the show, just showing so many different types of people who are in Golden, and also the buyer side, the seller side different areas of the world, you know, traveling on, on, you know, to, to, to all different continents and all that. And so, um, I, I want to say, I mean, this is like jokingly, but also seriously, like my kids love the show due to like, whenever they would show the sibling rivalry between the Mannings, Peyton and Eli, it was just so funny. And I didn't know he was a producer on the show. Peyton was, so that's really cool. Um, but let's talk about if if it's okay with you again. I don't know what you're able to talk about and not able to talk about because we didn't talk about it beforehand. But how was it filming on the show? It, it was amazing, and quite frankly, I did sign an NDA about certain aspects of it. I couldn't tell you uh, what that NDA has in it or had mm -hmm. in it. So mm -hmm. uh, if I speak out of school, I guess uh, someone will be reaching out to me. But I, <laughs> I I'm not going to be giving away any secret sauce, right? But uh, right. being on the show was a really cool experience they were mm -hmm. uh you know all the folks involved whether you know was golden or the production teams and like you said i i didn't know all of the individuals that were involved on the back end of it as far as uh you know investors producers etc but really a great team to work with they had us pretty much in and out of there in you know half a day um really took care of us so uh, the overall experience was great i think the hardest part was you know, waiting to see when it was going to come out. Right. And, uh, yeah. and I had no idea what else was going to be in the show. Right. And that's what I found to be really the coolest part of the show. Like you said, it touched, you know, so many different collectibles, so many different parts of the world. So I, I think it turned out to be an unbelievable show that uh, really had something for everybody. No, absolutely. That's a great way to put it. That's something for everyone. They wanted to pull in. I mean, either intentionally or unintentionally, they pulled in people who are not in the hobby. Uh, people, again, it was, I think it was really smart, again, whether it's intentional or unintentional to have, you know, uh, the music items, the, you know, the the Jimi Hendrix thing, the, the Britney Spears thing, like these items that people are like, you know, like uh, Madonna, just wow. Like my wife was like, you know, she's she's on her phone, and I'm watching it with my uh, with my older son, and she's like, oh, that's that's uh, you know, that's neat, that's cool. I wonder how much that is. And then of course, my kids are after that show, are just wa walking around the house, or talking about my cars, like how much is that? How much is that? How much is that? And it's like there's an intrinsic value. You know, I would just right. tell them like, yes, there's the appraisal value, but then there's the value that you know someone can emotionally have and. I told them, you know, there are some cars that are worth not much in, in dad's collection, but I wouldn't sell them for anything because they're just, they mean so much to me. So, um, but no, that's great. I, it's, so when it comes to the show, you said like a half day shooting, you didn't know what you were going to be, uh, what was going to be edited out, right? Like you, you had no clue, like what they were going to use and not use. Right. So. And not at all. And it, you know, it really wasn't scripted at all. Right. You know, maybe there were a couple instances where, you know, they'd give us some direction on, hey, here's what we're teeing up and give your natural responses. Um, you know, not a lot of, you know, retakes or anything along those lines. So it was pretty much off the cuff, which uh, was nerve wracking, but at the same time, pretty cool and exciting. That is so awesome. Um, do you remember? OK, so there you're in new york can you just walk me through like just the day of the shooting again not asking for any like uh any secret sauce here but like you didn't have to say fly across the country you drove from from westchester to jersey like two three hours I, well i mean i'm, I'm adding in traffic y'all because i know new jersey and new york are right next to each other but believe me it's it, it is not like uh 
a skip in the park if it's uh especially if it's rush hour but i mean tell me like yeah like did you uber there did you did they have a car service come to you did you drive there yeah they they offered you know to do basically anything we wanted right i was I said, hey, I'm going to get in my car. I'll drive to Philly from New York. No big deal. Um, they had us come in the, the day before, ultimately put us up in a hotel and then, uh, you know, picked us up the next day at the hotel. And they ultimately ended up flying in um, Cop and King Mitts from, you know, other locations, right, based mm -hmm. on where they are. Um, but, yeah, it, it was first class. They took care of us, you know, all around. That's so awesome. So you said Philly. I thought the 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 warehouse or Golden headquarters was in Jersey or something like that. Am I am I not? Maybe they want people to think that. But where we <laughs> let's put it this way: where we shot was in Philly. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I won't tread any further. I don't want to get you in trouble. Um, no, all no, good. But I mean, I could be misremembering too. I mean, I I watched it. Uh, I mean, I watched your episode a couple of times because I wanted to like study it and learn. Um, but I, it was, it went by so quick. I mean, it was almost like, um, you know, people, uh, um, analogized it to, you know, like Pawn Stars or, you know, these other shows with appraisal values. But I mean, I, I enjoyed it so much and my, my family really did too. And when it comes to those other shows that do appraisal, like, you know, Antique Roadshow, I mean, those are like series that go on forever. And this one, it was six episodes. It was gone. It was like blink, blink my eyes and, and. It was over. And I was like, I want more. Give me more. I, I agree. I hope that, uh, you know, Ken Golden and team get a second season out of it. I mean, they certainly have plenty of content to provide. Right. So uh, I, I could definitely see that happening. Um, the only downside from the show is that they showed my bald spot too much when I kept like bending over. So I'm going to have to uh, I have to have words with some people about that but a little bit too late. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, well, I did not notice that. I really haven't. But it, it's it, it's so much like, uh, you know, when I, make, when I create content, it's like, I don't like the sound of my voice. I don't like this. I don't like this. Like, even right now, like, I'm like, yeah, I could have probably, well, I will say I shaved, I shaved for today. In today's episode, I shaved. I did not, I did not shave my face for, um, I think maybe, well, it's like the day after Father's Day. I was like, kind of like, just really enjoying my, my, my day. And I didn't go about doing it. But yes, I, I can get very self-conscious too. Um, it's it's probably why I have a tendency to clap back at trolls on the internet because I'm just like, hey, you know what? Like, I will fight back, um, which uh, people have told me not to do. But it's like it's not professional. It's all for fun anyway. But no, um, I I know what you mean, but I did not notice it. Like I said, my wife was like, he he is sharply dressed and he is he looks so professional. And I mean, I, I think at that point I had already watched it once, but then the second time uh, and I was almost like taking notes on my, you know, notes app on my phone while I'm watching the the show. And I was like, all right, wife says sharply dressed man. <laughs> so I gotta, so nothing to take away from the other two, uh, King Mitz and Cop. But uh, yeah, so you were in that office, um, I think maybe. I can't remember exactly how much screen time of the office time. Cause you know, they had the, in the moment where they talked to you guys separately, but it seemed like you guys were in that office for about air time wise, you know, somewhere between like two to three minutes, but you guys shot more than that. Right. We did. And um, you know, they did part, they did other pieces of content that they use for, you know, social media, not just for the Netflix filming. Right. So we spent a decent amount of time doing that as well. We actually got to, interact with uh, some other folks who are going to be on the show. I don't know if you saw oh, the episode with uh, the young teenager who uh, pulled the Lewis Hamilton. Oh, Lewis Hamilton. Yes. yes. So we have a, I have a pretty cool picture of, you know, the three of us with the LeBron triple logo man and he and his father with the Lewis Hamilton, which I mean, talk about life changing for that kid as a teenager, yeah. you know, $40 in a pack and selling it for who knows what the final amount was. It wasn't uh, disclosed, but it was That's right. I'm sure it was close to a million bucks. So. Right. So the five of you and those two cards all in one photo. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's you did cool not post thing. this on Instagram. Are you, are you allowed to post about it? Like, can, can you share it with me offline? <laughs> like, I would love, that's such a, that's like, I mean, already each card alone is like, a, you know, over a million dollars, but to combine those two and, and the, the sellers of the cards, that's just, that, that's gotta be such an amazing photo. I'll, I'll send it to you. I didn't want to post on social media because I didn't get a chance to, you know, 
with the kid who was still a teenager, I didn't want to go sure. about doing that. Um, but the reality is, I mean, it, the cool part about the picture, not only is it the five of us, the two gentlemen who bought the Lewis Hamilton card are in the picture as well. So that that deal went down like that day in their office, which was really cool. And to, to see those two cards together was really cool. We actually we held the Lewis Hamilton card and the kid held the LeBron triple logo man in the oh, picture. Oh, that's so that's cool. Wild. Yes. Yeah. Get, give each other a chance to hold the 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 Grail card or the life changing card. Is Absolutely. that's that's such an awesome um, like idea for you guys to do that for each other. That's so cool. Um, did you, I mean, I just, again, I'm, I'm off the rails here. I'm not even looking at my questions anymore because I wanted to ask you, were you kind of like me during the pandemic where, well, I mean, we're all getting stir crazy, but like, did you get into drive to survive? Uh, yeah. I think it was called Netflix um, drive to survive uh, the, the formula one show on Netflix. Did you get into that? You know, I haven't seen it yet. I've heard amazing things about it and it's uh, it's on my list. Definitely mm -hmm. need to watch it. Yeah. I, I gotta say, I, wish that it was more kid friendly so I could watch it with my kids because there's a lot of cursing. But I mean, my, my son, it's so wild. I mean, he loves to like, I have no, I'm not a car person. I'm a cards person, but he'll ask me like, you know, what is this logo of the card? You know, which one is that? Oh, that's a, sh you know, like he wants to know, are these cars domestic or international? And like, he just like wants to learn, I guess, you know, he's, you know, 10 years old, they just want to learn the world. So maybe it's just, it, it could be anything, but it's a while that he's so into cars and I'm like, he's into cards too, but I'm like, Hey, uh, I can't really, um, bond with you on cars. I mean, I, I can, cause I drive one, but like, I don't, <laughs> I don't love cars, but Hey, you want to, you want to, you want to do cards with me? <laughs> you know, like you right. want to, uh, you know, I'll, cause he loves Jason Tatum too. And he loves the Celtics, even though. I'm like trying to, I'm not trying to push him towards the Wizards because that's our home team, but I don't know how, but he found this one Larry Bird highlight reel and it's just, I mean, you and I know just how amazing, I mean, not even just a shooter. He was just like, he was so tough, yes. right? I mean, he was just so tough and and his passing and his grit and like even the way he hurt his back and he ended his career with like mowing his own lawn. It just sounds so wild like that. That just can't happen in today's NBA. But for him to fall in love with Larry Bird and Jason Tatum is just so wild to me because I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> it, it is amazing, right? And that's the beauty of YouTube, the internet, et cetera. Mm -hmm. you, you can go back and you could find the content. And uh, I still find myself going back and watching it and just remember as a kid, like either watching the games or I remember I had – I can't remember the name of the VHS tape, but it was basically a Michael Jordan tape that had like, you know, his story and all his highlights. I must have watched that <laughs> thing like 150 times before I played basketball. I was like, man, it was so great. Oh, well, OK, you opened a door. I got to ask. So you've played basketball. How how far into uh, the you know competitiveness did you go? Yeah, I mean, up until college and, you know, I was that's all I did pretty much played basketball. I wasn't yeah. a great, you know, baseball player. Um, certainly was too small to play football and didn't really, uh, I wish I had the opportunity to play lacrosse because I love the sport now, but mm. uh, never got into that. But yeah, basketball has always been my sport. And now that uh, I get hurt every time I touch a basketball, I transition to golf now that I'm 48 years old. So, Oh my goodness. So what was your position though on the court? Uh, point guard. Point guard. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, I mean, the, the number of point guards coming out of the New York, you know, street ball scene, you know, I'm thinking about Lance Stevenson, Stefan Marbury, uh, I think maybe Ray for Alston skipped to my loop, but yeah. maybe I'm, but like, I always said, and I, and again, I'm going to harken back to an older episode, <laughs> Uh, one of my very first, which is, I guess, not even a month ago, but it just sa seems so surreal how how much time has flown, flown by. But uh, I used to always tell folks that I was never a good shooter in because I grew up playing basketball in New York uh, at, on the street, uh, you know, like street ball on, yep. the, on the blacktop uh, because because um, of the elements, the wind, like no one was a good shooter. Even those three players, as I mentioned, they're so good at driving to the basket. They're so good with their handles. Not that I'm so good with my handles, but 
they would get to the rim and finish there instead of shooting, you know, like it wasn't like Steph Curry in a, you know, growing up with his dad, Del Curry in a, in an air conditioned indoor court where you could just shoot over and over and practice your shot, you know, kids in New York city, like we're, we're outside and literally the wind will affect your shot. And right. I mean, help me out here. <laughs> Back me up. No, no, you're spot on. I mean, I, my, <laughs> one of my favorite basketball players was Kenny Anderson, oh, right? Yeah. And he was an unbelievable point guard, right? Went to Georgia Tech um, and, and then ultimately went pro. But you're right. And the game has changed so much now. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why I get frustrated with the NBA now because it is like a three-point shooting contest yeah. almost every game, right? right. It's, it's completely different. But I agree with you, man. There, there's a... And I was a huge Syracuse fan and like Sherman Douglas. Oh, like, the general. I mean, he was to me like the greatest <laughs> thing ever, right? But yeah, uh, point guards were uh, a lot different back then. So these folks you just mentioned have to have got to be some of the cheapest people to PC. Like they don't have, oh, yeah. I mean, maybe they're star rubies, right? But like we're talking people who did not get past the, you know, like the junk wax era uh, 1.0, whatever you want to call it. Agreed. So do you PC those folks too, then maybe? You know what? I can't say that I do. Um, but if I came across a car, I would definitely scoop it up, but I'm not actively out there looking for them. Yeah. I, I imagine if you saw uh, come across your, your, actually, let me ask you, do you go to local car shows in, in your area? I do. I do. There's the one, you know, old school guy that I do PC and it was just, Listen, I'm a Caucasian male, and I thought it was amazing that like Rex Chapman was like one of the greatest dunkers of all time. Sorry, and he, he was the guy that I would go around and try and find his card. So I used to have uh, I still have a couple of his. But uh, yeah, he, he was my guy for a while, too. I think University of Kentucky, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then and then there was like Brent Barry who won a dunk contest doing the right. free throw dunk. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. Remember a guy. I mean, the Barry family is very was very good um, in general. But uh, yeah, it was like that when the Charlotte Hornets became that expansion team and they had like J.R. Reed, Rex Chapman, like they had some <laughs> they were a fun, exciting team when they first started. You know, and then Larry Johnson went there. It was like, I don't know. I love those teams. Oh, my gosh. Grandmama. Uh, yeah, just right. the, that. Larry Johnson, I, it's really interesting because well, he was a Nick, right? The four point play against the Pacers. I mean, I very much remember he, he that. Was, he and Charles Oakley were just. Uh, I mean, that's when basketball you'd like, you know, clothesline people when they came down the lane, which uh, <laughs> those were the days. And I'm sorry, maybe it wasn't the Pacers, but I remember the, the it was the most famous four point play, right? I mean, oh, yeah. I remember where he shot it. It's 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 my favorite spot in NBA Jam. It's like that furthest from the screen, like at the top of the near the scores table type of thing um that's NBA right. jam but uh no that's so funny i i did not anticipate we we're gonna go down the 90s rabbit hole but hey i love doing that it's just so i mean that's why i do this it's 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 about the nostalgia so what i was gonna say is if you saw a kenny anderson star rubies in one of your dealers in your local shop you're you're picking that up i mean you may negotiate a little bit but that's that's getting scooped up that day it, it if I saw it, I would certainly yeah. be attempting to get it. Yeah, and I don't even know if they I, – I think he he has to have one. I mean, again, I haven't checked the – I don't know the whole checklist, but I feel like maybe Sherman Douglas wouldn't, but then I could be wrong about that as well. But, um, I mean, Kenny Anderson was definitely – I mean, him and Derek Coleman, beloved, oh, yeah. the Nets. I mean, just the old classic Nets. Um, let me say my biggest pull of my life for myself, because I, you know, the Desmond Ritter, that's like the biggest pull that, you know, that I've had in my hands. But I actually pack pulled a 2007, 2008 Upper Deck Artifacts, Jason Kidd neck emblem. So actually we're talking about triple logo man. And uh, I'm actually writing a piece for a, a, a magazine about, um, you know, logo men versus like, neck emblems because if you're a team if you're a huge fan of a team i mean yeah logo mans are awesome and nfl shields are cool but wouldn't you want a game used logo of your team so this was back when uh jason kidd was on the nets so on that checklist uh i think it was the three players they had were vince carter richard jefferson and jason kidd and i pulled i i don't even know it's definitely not even a case hit. it's like multiple case hits oh yeah um it was a one of one neck emblem. Like, so picture the the Nets logo on Jason Kidd's jersey. Right. right. 
and I pulled that and I sold it for like two hundred dollars. Like, <laughs> um, you know, now it's like a several thousand dollar card. But of course, back then I I sold it to a to some supposed super collector of Jason Kidd, who who later I found out sold it during the pandemic because you could track it on you know eBay sales. But apparently right. it, it transacted. He told me he would keep it forever and all this stuff when he was trying to buy it off me. So it happens. Um, oh, yeah. Not 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 the windfall of a triple logo man of a LeBron, but um, <laughs> we've all got those stories. Though I have plenty sure of cards that oh man, I wish I still had. Uh, I actually had the whole 1986 Fleer basketball set and a PSA nine, like probably in 19. 99 2000 and i sold it i sold it in like 2003 when i bought a house Got for it. nothing for Good reason to what it's yeah what it is now absurd i've heard some people actually sell that as a set like it's almost like the whole set minus jordan like right. it's almost like you have to disassociate that one card from the rest of the set but you right. have the entire set together and sold the entire set and the stickers too which the, is, uh, it, it was it was painful. Oh, now that I think about it, it, it's extremely painful. I don't want you to. <laughs> I, I didn't bring you on to have you have super regret and super painful moments. No, but not I, at all. I do appreciate the vulnerability. Um, I, I don't want to end on that note. I, I feel like we. I need to like wash, rinse this out with one more topic before I let you go because I don't want to end on this. Um, so I've asked you about your highs. I mean, that is a low, I guess. I mean, but you sold it for a good reason. You, you got a house, right? I mean, it went towards the the, the funds for a, for the house you currently live in, or it, 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 that, yep, yep, in 03. There you go. I mean, yep. 20, 20 years in the house. You you got. I mean, I don't know. Some people pay off their mortgages earlier, but you know, you're you're more than halfway to the end of your mortgage with that. I, I mean, right. I'm like still in the first half of of hours and. Um, I don't remember, <laughs> like I was not into cards when we were actually, we, I was, I was, um, it was 2012. So I think you and I are both going to national, you know, separately, but I, I'm looking forward to meeting you. I believe Absolutely. you're going right. Um, two thousand. it wouldn't be, it won't be my first national. I went 2012. It was in Baltimore at that time. And my son, my older son was born at the end of 2012. And so this, this national was July or August of that year. And I was collecting at that time, but I think as soon as my older, uh, as soon as my firstborn was was born, um, I just kind of shut it down. I think, um, and I, I wasn't even asked to by my wife or anyone. I just, I think I just, you know, more power to the people who have young families who are in who are in the hobby. Right. But I think my capacity, I just knew I couldn't. You know, it wasn't even a financial thing. It was like podcast. You know, like all the things I'm doing now, I just don't think I would have been able to do back then. Um, but no, I just, uh, I love, uh, I mean, th those stories, I mean, that's, that's why we do all this, right? I mean, and Absolutely. you seem like so, you, you, you're clearly a, a person who, who remembers the old school basketball and, and reveres it and that nostalgia. I mean, I mean, I just love, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Me too. It's, uh, I could talk basketball all day. So. <laughs> we're, we're definitely going to have to uh, offline and we'll, uh, definitely, talk about a national we're not going to hit the courts though right i mean my knees and my back are so messed up that... yeah I, um, every time i play i end up hurting something recently it was like a partial strain of my achilles so i'm like all right i just uh it, it's not oh, worth it at this point yeah um i think that steve nash actually near the end of his career um and he had back issues and uh, like a bunch of things but he um i think he said something about like if he could just play like once a week, like if he could, like, you know, the body recovering, right. I mean, you and I know yeah. this very well, like weekend warriors, you, you do something and you're just so sore for several days. And I think for Steve Nash, he was kind of like, I can play at a high level, like occasionally, but if you are on the NBA grind and you got to play like back to backs or three games in four nights or five nights, he was just like, I can't do it because it's the, the wear and tear. And so for, us uh you know older older folks it's it's like we it's hard to sustain i think it's and and i guess that's why people get into golf it's just less although there's a lot of torque with the swings i don't know you tell me how like 
golf. Golf is terrible for your back. <laughs> that's for sure. But uh, yeah, well, that's why it amazes me. Someone like a LeBron or a Tom Brady who can play that long, right? Now, granted, the NBA is totally different now, right? A lot of these guys mm-hmm. don't play back-to-backs. There's time management, all yeah. that stuff. But at the end of the day, to be that age and to play at that level, is it, it's unbelievable. It really is. It's very admirable. I mean, all these big, uh, the records where it's longevity, right? I mean, you can be, I mean, not that anyone young can just do, you know, just just destroy the world. But, you know, Derek Rose, I mean, he was the yeah. youngest MVP. And we're literally talking about someone who is going to be a asterisk in the NBA history where he's going to be the very likely. And I, I didn't want this to become like a whole like, Let's talk. We're talking. We're talking. We're talking. Like, <laughs> oh, I can't. I can't stop talking to Jason. But I. I know we have to end soon. But he is going to go down in history as the only Hall of uh, only MVP to not make the Hall of Fame. I think that's going to happen. Unless, I mean, I don't know what could he do to make the Hall. But he won the MVP. He's the youngest ever. That's already a huge accolade. But he's not going to make the Hall. Like, that's just really sad. It's extremely sad. And uh, what an unbelievable, I was actually recently watching highlights of his MVP year. And I think it was Joakim Noah was talking about like, they were on the verge of that playoff run. They were going to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. I I feel terrible for that guy. And uh, you're right. It's uh, what a superstar athlete. Right. Him. Yeah. Bo Jackson, just, well, Zion had his own stuff, but basically like, the longevity, I mean, really, it just, it just, it's so impressive. It it's is. so absolutely impressive to continue to do that. So, yeah. so we'll see. Um, Jason, it's, it, it was just an absolute pleasure to have this chat with you. Um, the time, I say this with every guest, but it's so true. The time just flies by. Agreed. And I, if other podcast, uh, uh, podcasters and content creators are listening, I mean, honestly, they would be wise to reach out to you and have them on your pod to talk about what we talked about, but maybe different spins or angles. Um, But I I, I wish you nothing but the best. Um, And oh, my gosh, a little bit over a month, we'll we'll meet up in Chicago and, um, you know, just just have a great time. So thank you again. Oh, I got to ask you one last thing. Are you getting your own room or are you <laughs> crashing with a buddy? Because apparently that's like the big thing people are talking about nowadays. It, it's funny you bring that up. I had booked a room like because I went to AC last year, mm-hmm. right, for the national. And I remember what a challenge that was getting a room so late mm-hmm. in the game. So I booked my room probably three, four months ago mm-hmm. um, and didn't have an issue. Right. But now it seems like that's becoming a, a major challenge. So. To answer the question, I will be staying solo, and uh, I snore a lot, so that's of the benefit of anybody that would be staying with me. So. Oh my! I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm gonna. Whoever is listening this far in, uh, I have to debate whether I'm going to bring my CPAP machine or ha- bring more cards. That is what happens when you're this old or like this out of shape. Or I actually, you know, there's a lot of men who have uh, sleep apnea more than more than women, but um. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I'll make some content around that. Like, just see, survive. Like, like actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or maybe I put some slabs into my C- CPAP machine to like, there you go. like you compact, you know, you put like socks and, you know, like uh, crevices of your luggage. Oh I'm, my I'm God. sure TSA would love that. They would, uh, they have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> maybe. Oh my goodness. Jason, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, wishing you the absolute best with breaks, with being in the hobby. And I really look forward to meeting you in uh, in in a little bit over a month here. And just thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast. Denny, thank you, man. It's uh, I know we went back and forth for a little while. It's been fantastic. And uh, really appreciate that the you know your kids took the time to come up with some questions and uh, your wife was so kind making the comments that she did so really appreciate it wish you nothing but the best and I can't wait for us to uh, hang in uh, what is it six weeks something like that five weeks yeah looking forward to it awesome thank you so much take care have a good evening you got it thanks Denny